Welcome to yet another Friday afternoon of uh, dipping into a book or two. And this is going to be Still Meadow and Sugar Bridge. Now, those of you who listened for the last two weeks um, know that I was, was uh, doing Marjorie Kinnon Rollins and what actually inspired this particular performance is the fact that Edward Shenton was the illustrator for uh, Marjorie Kinnon Rollins, and I absolutely loved his illustrations. And doing a little research, I discovered that he was married to Barbara Webster, and he and she uh, fixed up, renovated a wonderful house in Pennsylvania called Sugar Bridge. It's a stone farmhouse, uh, one of the warm and cozy kind of uh, houses that you see dotted along the countryside in, in Pennsylvania. And none other than Gladys Tabor, who had kind of a similar trajectory in Connecticut with a house called Still Meadow, which was a Cape Cod house. Uh, nestled in some woods on a wonderful piece of property. Uh, both of them lived in by what I would call women of substance, attitude, and survival extincts, uh, in, instincts par excellence. This particular book is really, rather than normally found on the shelves of uh, story and song is one that you would be more likely to run into in the uh, at the head of the steps leading up to the second floor, and that would be the collection of rare and collectible books that waits for your uh, delectation uh, at the dark top of the dark of the steps. Um, now, having said all that, I want to give you a visual picture. The flyleaf is marvelous. There's a large tree that takes up half of the first page, and it's a picture of Still Meadow nestled into its wood, and there's, there's some smoke coming out of the chimney, and there's a path that leads across the bottom that morphs into a series of leaves that resolves in the next page, thanks to Shenton's creativity, into the Pennsylvania farmhouse. Sugar Bridge, and there's a bright sun and birds uh, flying through the sky. And of course, what I didn't mention was over Still Meadow and the uh, chimney in the smoke looms a crescent moon. So you have a pretty good uh, idea of what you can expect just by the visual hints. Now, at the head, and this, these are letters that the two women have exchanged with each other, and uh, Shenton has just visually commented on them. And in the beginning of the January section, there's uh, what's called a bank barn, very Pennsylvania thing, um, that's nestled into some, uh, some trees, and there's a, uh, a um, mailbox with a flag up indicating that... Uh, there's some action there for the mailman to take part of. And right on the opposite page is a statue from Chartres of the cathedral. And it shows the two sides of the Janus figure, youth and age. And it begins January, Sugar Bridge, a new year. Dear Gladys, do you know that wonderful figure of two-headed Janus on the uh, doorway of Chart Cathedral? On one side, a long-haired youth gazes eagerly ahead. On the other, a bearded old man contemplates the past. That's the way I feel in January. When I look back, I know we have got just what we wanted out of life. It was Goethe who said, Beware of what you wish when you are twenty. You will have it when you're forty. Well, we were twenty, or thereabouts, 
and a couple of giddy art students to boot, Ed and I, when we thought that the end of all desiring was a house in the country and enough time to work. Now we are older and we have got our wish, but it still seems good to us. Um, we are not wildly successful, nor will we ever become millionaires, but our life at Sugarbridge does give us the intensest personal satisfaction. I like that pronouncement of Osbert uh, Sitwell to the effect that a writer should see a considerable stretch of time ahead of him before he starts upon a project, because it somewhat excuses my inability to work an hour or so, then dash off to keep an engagement, do some chores, perhaps, and come back to writing once more. Broken up day is to me a lost day. And social and business states, no matter how delightful or important, hang over me with a sense of doom. So I am particularly grateful for those long intervals of country peace when we see no one nor stir from our studio, except for an afternoon ramble over the hills. We no longer live by the clock, slaves to time. We make our own. Even our animal family has learned to be patient. Duke stretches out his great Danish length beside my bed, waiting for me to get up and give him breakfast venturing only a few cello-like moans if I oversleep. Meow, with his Siamese caterwauling, is more demanding. But he, too, has been brought to reason, since we are as stubborn as any cat. Now, Chief, down in his stall, has to be long-suffering. The barn is too far away for us to hear. Only his glad nickering, when we do finally appear, tells the story of his privations. He has other lapses, too, to forgive us. Sometimes, when we run out of feed, he has been known to subsist for days on oatmeal or shredded wheat biscuits. Yet, our own schedule is elastic. So. Why not theirs? A dinner is ready when I have finished cooking it. Ed sits in a small window alcove in the kitchen, looking out over the garden. From this point of vantage, he oversees my cooking and drinks his uh, evening cocktail. When a, a lilting tune comes over the radio on the wind wide window sill, he makes me drop what I'm doing, and we dance a little, while Duke regards us with a worried air from the sidelines. Yet we did not always live this way. Through many years we have been becoming uh, what we are today, years of innumerable errands that more or less conventional living brings. A maid to be fetched, a boy to be taken to school, dancing class, Sunday school, of, of trains to be caught, of days at the office. In those times we used to think longingly, oh, if we could ever be free of this round, if we could work or, or not work at will. Now this came to pass, finally. The boy grew up, went away to college. The job was given up. The maid no longer needed. We stood on the threshold of our long-awaited dream world. Now, Gladys responds from Still Meadow, and I love the heading 
of this particular letter, letter, it says, weather, terrible. And it begins, dearest Barbara, we saw the new year in the very best way, sitting by the fire and playing our favorite records, just six of us, and talking between times and feeling somehow secure in the steadfast house and the quiet fields and the woods outside. I never was much of a horn blower or confetti thrower, even before we moved to the country. And a roast goose on the old trestle table is better than a sliver of chicken at a nightclub for my money. After the new year came in on the midnight, Jill and I had a few chores to do. You know, dogs out, dogs in. Guppy moved to a warmer spot. The dishwasher to turn on, the heater to fill. Then a few minutes of conversation. You'll be surprised to know we decided it was a, a fine thing we moved to the uh, country just when we did, and that the children had grass under their young feet so much of the time. Now, even when the mortgage reared its ugly head, we never regretted it. Oh, ho, ho. and now it is fine to know Everything is paid for, uh, or our f 40 acres, although how can man own God's earth, and the 1690 farmhouse, and the barn, even the pond, and presumably that uh, cricket chirping endlessly on the hearth is also ours. Seems only yesterday that we first came down this winding country road, knee deep in ice water, leaving the real estate man to dig out his car. Now we had to get in through the cellar and the steps were half gone. We emerged into the coldest, bleakest room in the world. And there was the fireplace with its hand-hewn stones and rusted iron fittings. It's our house, I said firmly, through chattering teeth. I may tell you that those people who sail on rafts to Peru are not a bit more adventuresome than we were at that time. Two women, three young children, and three cocker spaniels, and no well-heeled husbands to turn over their paychecks. It is still an adventure, and the children are on their own, more or less, and the roof is tight, and the freezer is full, and the furnace is modern now. I just know a lot of people ask you why you moved out into the country, and if you don't get bored in winter, I don't think anybody could get bored in the country. For one thing, you can't sit down long enough. Things happen. Pipes burst. Well goes dry. Heaters go, go off. Dogs get sick. Ah, mice arrive in the back kitchen. Japanese beetles swarm on the special roses. Company drives up. Huh. In the end, all the world comes to the country for weekends. And you hope there's time to do the laundry before the next batch comes round the mailbox corner. The house has smelled of wet cocker fur and lentil soup all day. A nice combination. I woke up to a much more violent smell and leapt to my feet and rushed to the kitchen. No, the house is not on fire said Jill calmly. I only burned up the fat for the dog's breakfast. It, it just flamed up. 
The whole house reeked with smoke and particles of, of soot sifted on my breakfast tray. But the only casualty was the stove asbestos mat, which now looks like a barbecue grill. And Jill had sprayed everything with the fire extinguisher, which left a white, chalky silt all over. Oh, but the house was definitely not on fire. Now, your stone house is, is not such a fire hazard, but when you think that the old clapboards of, of Still Meadow were hand cut over 200 years ago, and the old batten doors painted and painted down the years, and the wide floorboards oiled and waxed, oiled and waxed, and not exactly fireproof anywhere. You do think about fire. But fire is everywhere. When I make a, a maternal visit to Connie, that's her daughter, who has an apartment near Columbia where she teaches, I often leap up in the night and watch the great massive fire engine swish past the stoplights at the corner and wonder just who is tumbling out of bed and running for the street. City folk never know where the fire is, but we in the country listen to our siren and know. And the volunteer firemen drop their plows or saws or let the cows stand in the stalls waiting to be milked and fly over the roads. Now, George, the one you met, who is our neighbor and helps with the kennel and furnace, is a top fireman. He works a full 14-hour day, but often jumps up at two in the morning and starts his old car, dashes off to fight the common valley menace, and gets at his chores at six the next morning without any thought that he's a, a homespun hero. Now, you must know George better. Although he is the son of a Lithuanian refugee from long time ago, he is the Yankeeest of Yankees. <laughs> Cheerful, always, hard-working, closed-mouthed, he goes his way. If he does something extra special for us and we thank him, he uh, blushes and looks at the ground and says, well, must help neighbors. He has only one day off a year, and that is the day he rises early plucks chicken, drives to the fireman's clan bake, and cooks and serves all day. Now for this, he wears a new blue shirt and dark pants, oh, and looks handsome. Once in three years, he and his wife do go over to the Danbury Fair, and that's all. Whenever he comes stamping in to get the dog food for the kennel, and I see his wide and shining smile. I think of all the neurotic people in the world who believe they have a hard life. <laughs> he will always stop to bring in extra wood or fuss with the water pump, which is making wild sounds downstairs, or get the car started on a sleety morning, or shovel a path to the gate or go for the mail. And if we are in trouble, we simply go to the gate and scream. And he materializes from the barn or the upper fields on a swift, bending lope. Quite a guy. And I go to another letter and these are all in January, and I, I didn't mention, but the uh, publication date of this was 1953. So these letters are basically from 51 and 52. This is way back in time. Still 
meadow. It says, dear and far away. Do you ever have a moment that is absolutely exquisite? Such moments are rare and are like holding a pink pearl in your palm. Happiness, I think, is being able to live those moments when they come. Now, I had one going out into the moonlight at bedtime with three cockers and the Irish taking a last look around. It was a pale winter mist over the meadows and the sky was a clear, dark, wider meadow blossoming with stars. The air was quiet and cold and smelled of wood smoke. The front door lantern shone on the sugar maples. The boughs were very dark and motionless. I held the moment in my hand. Love to Sugar Bridge. Now let me get to another letter here. This is from Sugarbridge. Day's ending. Dear Gladys, what a wonderful climate bed is. Of refuge from all care, a place to lick one's wounds and to plan afresh for the future. I often think that when by the efforts of primitive man, beds got up off the ground and no longer were merely a, a heap of skins and truly important discovery was made, and I am all against some modern thought for considerations of space saving, um, proposes to fold them up into the walls or do away with them all together, you know, in the Japanese style. Beds have a soul, I think, in their infinite variety, from the heavily curtained bed of medieval times to the satin padded ease of today's Hollywood bed, and as such, I have a sentimental attachment for them. One of the chief delights of country life is going to bed early, no, right after dinner, in fact, preferably upon a rainy or snowy night when you can hear the gentle sound of the elements upon the roof and rejoice that you are inside Although sometimes in the green twilight of deep summer, it is enchanting with the birds still fluting a bedtime song and in rags of vivid sunset color still visible through the windows. Well, now when I say go to bed, oh, I don't mean to sleep. Not at once, that is, though it is delicious to do so intermittently. The real purpose is to read, and I do not know any more satisfactory way to accomplish the thing, to read quite interrupted, fall asleep, to wake, and read again. There is no more delectable way to uh, spend an evening. Now. Let me see. I think with that, I'm going to close our reading of these wonderful letters that were exchanged from one house in Connecticut to one house in Pennsylvania, and remind you that over two weeks, we were telling stories about one house in Florida, not all that far away from Fernandina. It seems that women and houses and places have quite an affinity. And what fun it is to uh, explore all of these. And now, until next Friday, when we're going to take a completely different adventure. Don't yet know what it is, but we'll let you know in the newsletter. Till then... You have a fantastic weekend or what's left in it. And might I suggest, you know, it's chilly outside and you know there's rain in the sky. 
Why don't you just crawl into bed with a good book? That is what, in one half hour, I intend to do. Till next week, take care.